and this is Keynote, the daily now.tv chat show with some of the world's leading thinkers and writers. Hello, everybody. It is Tuesday, uh, August the 15th, 2023. Uh, just off a really interesting show with my old friend Dave Weiner, one of the fathers of blogging and RSS software, a man who in many ways has architected our social media um, digital world. He's also uh, the author of Scripting News, one of the longest, uh, uh, one of the, 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 the longest lasting blogs. He's been blogging for about 30 years. And in our conversation, Um, He explained why he invented the blog, a piece he wrote in 2012 for Gizmodo. And he suggested that one reason was that he didn't trust big media. He didn't trust the newspapers or the television channels. He wanted to give everyone the platform to enable them to broadcast their own news. This issue of the scarcity of trust, the crisis of trust is one uh, that uh, we've discussed many times on the show before. Once had Richard Edelman um, of Edelman Media on the show. He invented something called the Trust Media Barometer, and that's been dropping ever since we've begun talking about it. So the question becomes in our age where nobody trusts anyone anymore, or at least they don't seem to trust anyone, how does trust work, which is exactly the subject and title of uh, my guest's new book, How Trust Works, The Science of How Relationships Are Broken, sorry, The Science of How Relationships Are Built, Broken, and Repaired. Uh, And the author is Peter Kim, who teaches at uh, USC, he's in the business school, and uh, he's dedicated 20 or 30 years of his life to researching trust. Peter, congratulations on the new book. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you for having me. So um, before we get to how trust works, Peter, do you agree with many pessimists who believe that we're in a crisis of trust in 2023? I think the evidence is consistent with that view. Uh, Every survey I've encountered has Uh, indicated that trust has been in the decline, uh, regardless of whether it's in institutions, in the media, um, in uh, one another. (laughs) Lately, uh, there's even evidence that trust in higher education has been on the decline. So this has been uh, a broad phenomenon, and it's not uh, limited to the U.S. Uh, You see this around the globe as well. And in fact, in the introduction to your book, you point to another of our, ironically enough, trusted um, uh, trusted research groups, the Pew Research Center, that suggests that in 2019, uh, 64% of respondents in the U.S. felt that their trust in one another is diminished. So before we explain why that's the case, Peter, let's get to how trust works, how would you broadly define it? Why do we trust some people and not others? Trust is broadly defined as a willingness to make oneself vulnerable in situations involving risk uh, based on positive expectations uh, that we might have of the trustee. So it's a complicated definition, but uh, it really requires uh, several ingredients. One, Uh, the willingness to undertake risk, Uh, and uh, two, this this psychological sense that the other person uh, will warrant uh, that trust, that that risk that you might take in them. Uh, Undertaking risk uh, is an interesting concept, but with families, for example, do, do we undertake risk when we trust our mothers or fathers or relatives? Well, uh, so risk is a matter of degree. Uh, Sometimes uh, there are actions we might take to mitigate risk. Sometimes we have no choice. And so that's where the willingness uh, component uh, becomes important. So if you're in a situation where you have no choice but to take risk, 
uh, that doesn't necessarily signify trust. So if you are uh, an infant uh, relying on a mother, then uh, that there is no real volition involved. It, it really requires that decision on the part of the trustor uh, based on the sense that the trust is worthwhile. Does it depend, though, Peter, on the type of risk that's involved? Um, I'm sure you're familiar with uh, the great movie, uh, The Godfather, especially Godfather 2, in which, uh, actually Godfather 1, in which somebody comes to the Godfather because uh, their daughter had been raped uh, and he wanted revenge. He trusted the Godfather to, um, to, to be violent against uh, the, the, the people who had raped their daughter. And the Godfather was angry. Uh, the Godfather said, why did, why did you wait? Why, why, why didn't you come to me immediately after this happened? What you saw were parallel kinds of risk. He could have gone to the state. He could have gone to the police. But that didn't work. So we went to the Godfather. So when it comes to undertaking risk, are there always rival types of trust, Peter, that exist which may not be explicit, but we sort of manage in our own heads? Absolutely. So the uh, type of situation uh, and the type of relationship matters great, a great deal. Uh, the evidence indicates that we consider as many as 10 different characteristics when evaluating whether someone is trustworthy or not. Uh, and the importance of those characteristics will differ depending on the situation. Uh, for example, uh, you, you may trust uh, the godfather to, to be very good at committing violence uh, and, and being able to execute on that, but you may not necessarily trust uh, him for other things, um, to, to have integrity in other aspects of society. So uh, certainly the, the type of relationship matters quite a bit, uh, and that in turn affects whether or not you're willing to undertake uh, that risk, whether you're willing to make yourself vulnerable or not. The Godfather, of course, was Don Corleone. Um, and I think many people simply assume, they take it for granted, that he represents a more primitive kind of social system for trust. And that when we get to the modern state, where the state, the police, laws are distant from where we are, uh, it's more modern. Is there some truth to that? Um, in 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 societies, pre-modern societies, agricultural societies, societies before the birth of modernity, uh, was trust generally a, a, a patrimonial thing, Peter? Well, societal trust is based on your faith in things like laws, norms, institutions. Uh, so to the extent that society has developed those things, you are more likely to exhibit trust in one another, even if you don't know uh, the trustee well or at all. Uh, so uh, to the extent that societies can develop those, those features, uh, that can be very, very important in, in enabling the kind of trust that we might want uh, in society. So. Uh, certainly, uh, th that that individual that uh, approached uh, Don Corleone, he uh, lost trust in the institutions that he had believed in up to that point. Um, and, and so, what are the alternatives? Uh, the, the alternatives are trust in the individual to get something done. Uh, in this case, he he wanted revenge, and uh, or as he would say, justice uh, in, in the film. Um, and he believed that Don Corleone uh, could fulfill that w uh, when the institution itself could not. Yeah, it's interesting in that film, I don't want to just talk about The Godfather, but it's one of my favorite films, is that the risk for The Undertaker was going to Don Corleone. Once he risked that, he knew he was breaking the law, uh, but he trusted Don Corleone more than he, well, certainly he trusted the consequences of Corleone's involvement in the tragedy of his daughter more than he would the state. 
Um, leaving aside Don Corleone, the closest thing perhaps we have these days, Peter, is a man called Donald Trump. He's been charged today, as you know, and all of us know, with uh, him and 18 allies charged in a kind of mob justice when it comes to overturning the 2020 election. You write about uh, the January 6th insurrection in the book, so you're quite familiar with this case. There are going to be two kinds, or I guess there's three kinds of reactions to these latest headlines, and they've been a familiar theme for much of the Trump age. On the one hand, people who trust the media, trust the Washington Post, trust the New York Times, trust the legal system that believe in what they're doing. Those who don't believe any of it, often they watch Fox News and they see it as a, a deep state conspiracy and they simply distrust everything about the state. And then a third group who are mystified and lost and have no idea what to think. How would you make sense of the headlines today in terms of your analysis of trust? Well, I would first start by considering Trump and his popularity and his election as uh, a sign of how little trust there had been in government. Uh, he was uh, an official that broke the mold, and it was the result of the, the, uh, the voters believing that the system itself was broken. So uh, from that perspective, uh, you know, he, he is a symptom of the broader problem that we have in society rather than the cause. He certainly hasn't helped <laughs> uh, the level of trust since. And, uh, you know, and, and in terms of the interpretations of uh, his attempts to overthrow the election uh, and stay in power, uh, you know, a, a lot of my book, you know, one of the things that it is, is a theme of the book is that the same objective situation can be uh, viewed very differently by different people. Uh, and, and sometimes that's the result of our motivations to view the incident differently. So uh, for those who are already supporters of Trump, I I'm sure they can interpret this as a sign of him uh, being victimized uh, by the justice system and, and so on. And, and of course, you know, many, many of them believe that he uh, had won that election. Uh, but for those that do have uh, faith in the government, faith in uh, uh, democracy and, and, and the institutions, even if it's lower than it might have been uh, to the extent that you have some faith in those things, uh, you, you can see these charges as uh, a hopeful sign that uh, the kinds of actions we saw uh, are not going to be tolerated in a, a system of democracy. Last week, we had Catherine Brownell, another academic, Catherine Kramer Brownell on the show, a media uh, scholar, teaches at Purdue University. She has a new book out. 24-7 politics, cable news, and the fragmenting of America from Watergate to Fox News. She suggests that it's that fragmentation, first with cable news and then, of course, with the Internet, which explains her book is not about trust, but she touched on it in our conversation, that that explains this crisis of trust, the one that you address in your book, that everybody from the Edelman Trust Barometer to the Pew Research Group, they all... Um, they all underline. Is it ultimately, Peter, when we look for reasons, is it media or is media itself a symptom? Where is the first mover in all this? Well, certainly uh, it's a complicated question. Uh, it's the, the media, the way uh, people have been tuning in to just slivers of uh, the media uh, based on their own predilections, that certainly makes the problem worse. Uh, there's some very basic principles uh, in, in, of psychology that suggest that if you're just exposing yourself to like-minded individuals, your views will become more extreme in that direction. And, uh, and we certainly see that in terms of the polarization today. 
whether or not uh, that's the full story is an open question. You know, well, the, you're the expert, Peter. We're, <laughs> we're relying on you. We're trusting in you. I mean, we, we need first movers here. It's all very well to say that Trump's a symptom or social media is a system or cable news is a, system, uh, is a symptom. But what's the disease? Where does this all come from? Well, it comes from what's in our heads. Uh, it's the way we tend to perceive the world uh, based on the situations we're in. So that is the fundamental issue. Uh, there are things in our mental basement uh, that affect the way we perceive the world. And the issue here is that we don't perceive the world as rationally, uh, as uh, carefully uh, as we'd like to think. Um, if I were to ask you how important trust is in your life, I'm sure you would say it's vital. Uh, and, and that's the case for anyone I, I, I've asked in the past. Uh, but despite that uh, importance, we tend to make these judgments quite poorly. Um, idiosyncratic features of the situation, subtle differences in how things are worded, uh, things that have nothing to do with the, the target in question, their actual trustworthiness, can make a dramatic difference in the trust we exhibit. Um, so I, I take your point. So it all comes from within our head, but of course... And the next question is, well, why is it in our head in the first place? Why are we having this crisis? Ne there's never been a perfect situation. We've never entirely trusted anyone or anything. I take, I mean, that goes without saying. But why is trust falling so much? I think part of it is that we are bombarded by instances of trust being violated, more so than we had in the past. And it's being presented in a way that is uh, very, um, it's amplified uh, in a certain direction. So in the past, media had presented these stories uh, in a very factual way uh, without much commentary and opinion. It was in a way quite boring. Uh, this is before the profit motive became such an important part of media. Uh, nowadays, uh, when you have these stories, there's always an opinion. There's always a, a, a point of view uh, that shapes people's mindsets. And oftentimes, that point of view is one that stokes the things that are in our mental basements. In particular, uh, media streams are very frequently saying, oh, not only did this happen, but this is why this happened. And isn't the culprit evil in some way? Uh, didn't, didn't they violate something uh, that, that's important to all of us, right? And, and so that may seem like a, a reasonable thing to do, but the problem is that these different media streams are framing the same situation in different ways and pointing to different reasons why the other side, those that might be uh, holding different opinions about the situation, why, why they're lacking in what's called integrity. Uh, they don't uphold the values we consider important. And what we know from the science is that when we believe the other side lacks integrity, th that they're doing something willfully that violates our principles, there is very little the other side can do to uh, address that kind of accusation other than deny it. Uh, if they seek to apologize, show remorse, uh, that doesn't do much good. Uh, as, and that's the result of how we tend to view these sorts of incidents. Uh, we, we don't view matters of integrity uh, in, in a neutral way. Uh, we see this negative information about integrity as so... so this, I, mean, I, I take your point on integrity. And when you watch what I think of as the, the preachers on media, whether it's people on the left like Rachel Meadow or people on the right on Fox News, they all present themselves as profoundly trustworthy and they say, trust me, and if you trust me, then you'll get the truth of the world and their truth of the world is always based on the lies of others. It always seems to me as if there's some sort of intrinsic religiosity here. Was this the case in the America of the 18th and 19th century when it was quite a religious society? Can we look back at a 
a more uh, ecumenical age, Peter, where it was religious people and religion deepening trust rather than undermining it? I think that's true. Uh, and, and, and the reason why is because back then people were getting uh, stories and interacting with people of like minds. So it's one thing if you're having this view and you all seem to have a similar view uh, on what's right and what's wrong. The problem nowadays is that we are not just interacting within our own tribes. We are having to reconcile very different views uh, across many different segments of the population that may view matters of integrity quite differently. So this is just, in your mind, is this just a condition of modernity, an inevitable, unavoidable condition? I think it is a challenge that modernity creates for us. Uh, there's a second question of whether or not we can overcome that. Uh, right, so that's the question. So, of course, the, the subtitle of your book is The Science of How Relationships Are Built. We've gone over that, broken. We've talked about that. And then perhaps more importantly than anything else, repaired. So you're still optimistic that this can get fixed. I am. Um, I don't think it's going to be easy. Uh, and it's going to require hard work, a change of mindset, and, an, uh, and a willingness to tackle our own assumptions about what's right, what's wrong, uh, how we make decisions, uh, and what we do when things get difficult because right now we're not really doing that kind of hard work. And, and that's one of the goals of the book to, to really explore what that difficult work entails, um, it, what it means to even have integrity. Uh, it turns out that it's not as simplistic as we'd like to think. And if it's not as simple as we'd like to think, we need to be better at reconciling different views about what integrity means and having a real dialogue to to work through those differences. Do you have uh, e examples, case studies in the book, maybe America after the Civil War or other societies after a Civil War, where people begin to trust one another again? At the end of the book, I cover attempts to address some of the most egregious uh, humans or human rights violations we've experienced. Uh, that includes uh, South Africa after apartheid, uh, uh, the uh, Nuremberg trials, uh, um, and uh, the uh, Gagaka Gaga, Gaga, Gaga courts, sorry, <laughs> uh, in Rwanda. And it is an attempt to discuss both the successes and failures uh, of those efforts. So none of them were perfect. Uh, th there were some real issues uh, and limitations in those attempts. Uh, but one thing I would point to is in South Africa, uh, the report that was released talked about the importance of truth uh, and also delineated different kinds of truth. And uh, it, it talked about factual truth, personal truth, but then it talked about social truth. Uh, and, and that is a really important element of truth that we are lacking in nowadays. And that social truth is a, a, a essentially a matter of reconciling our different personal truths to come to a collective understanding of what's real or not. We don't have that right now. Uh, we have different segments of the population uh, advocating their own personal truths. Uh, and that's reinforced by uh, the different media streams that ch they choose to listen to and the, the, the people they choose to associate with. Uh, but until we move beyond that uh, to uh, reconcile the different personal truths that people might have, uh, to have a meaningful dialogue, uh, we're not going to get anywhere. And the problem is that any attempt to achieve that social truth, even in 
these uh, these major efforts to address these gross human rights viola violations, every one of those efforts has been susceptible to uh, a very uh, easy temptation to stop working hard at achieving that social truth and instead move from dialogue to domination. Uh, the attempt to just impose what you think is right on others uh, simply because that's, in your mind, the easier way to go forward. So we need to get, as you say, from our personal truth to a social truth. I wonder, you use the example of South Africa, which came to mind for me as well, though you obviously have done all your research here, and whether you haven't mentioned the F word, forgiveness. Um, and, and perhaps in South Africa, it required a man of enormous integrity and moral bravery like Nelson Mandela to, to lead his people from their personal truth to a social truth. How important are the Mandelas, the Martin Luther Kings of the world in terms of rebuilding truth? Or does this come from below in your mind? Well, um, it, Mandela uh, and in particular Desmond Tutu were extraordinarily important uh, in those efforts. Uh, and in fact, there was a moment when the Truth Commission was uh, facing a crisis where the uh, ANC, uh, African National Council, basically said, we don't want to be subject to the same same process as uh, you are subjecting um, uh, the, the, the prior government. Um, and uh, there was a moment where Desmond Tutu had to insist that uh, it has to be everyone. Everyone has to be included in this process. Uh, otherwise, uh, this entire process will fall apart. And, so how could this work in America? No, we, we... Tutu and Mandela, of course, were trying to get a society um, beyond apartheid, beyond the injustices of that system. And you know, I think probably some people would argue they didn't really succeed, although they, they had some success. How would that work in America? In an America divided, certainly today on uh, uh, August the 15th, 2023, between people who believe that the the, the 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 headlines about Trump are on the one hand justice and on the other hand profound injustice. How could it work? Where are we going to find uh, a Tutu or a Mandela who will enable all of us to get beyond our personal truths and create what you call a social truth? Well, first of all, I, I agree with you that uh, the the efforts of uh, Tutu and Mandela were not entirely successful. Uh, there were uh, real limitations in what they achieved, uh, in part because the government uh, did not implement uh, the whole set of recommendations that were made. And so th that's an illustration of uh, something that we're facing in the US. And it's that you can only do so much as an individual. What you need to do is change the situation. You need to adjust the system, the incentives in the system to uh, allow for what you're hoping to achieve. And right now, if we're to think about government, the, the incentives for politicians is not to lead. It's not to reconcile these different points of view. It is to be the mouthpiece for their, your uh, curated constituency that is the result of gerrymandering and attempts to redistrict, right? So what, what do we have here? We have a situation where these elected officials are in place as a result of an attempt to curate this, this district so that there's a unidimensional point of view. And that makes a party more likely to succeed in gaining that office. But what is the consequence of that? It, it prevents that elected official from doing anything other than what that unidimensional point of view is telling that person to do. Otherwise, they'll find someone to replace them, right? That's a horrible system. Uh, you can think about the comparison point, which would be a district that is so diverse 
uh, that, that contains all these points of view so that the person who is elected has much more freedom to listen to these different points of view, and their incentive is to speak to as many people in that district as but possible. But that, that sounds awfully abstract and utopian. How is that actually going to work in practice? You talk about um, repairing trust. How can it concretely work in America? Well, first of all, uh, there are court cases that have been going to the Supreme Court about how much redistricting is permissible. Uh, and so that's one place to start for, for the court system to say this is uh, not uh, democratic. It, it, it is uh, unconstitutional to, to not deny people that might be in uh, these regions uh, the, the, an equal vote. Uh, will that fix everything? No, but that's, uh, you know, a start. And then, you know, if we were to really... Uh, Think about what it takes for change. Uh, one, one source of uh, information or a point of view can be found in uh, international uh, relations. So uh, a point of view that is also talked about in the book is that people won't come to the table to seek this kind of dialogue until the other means through which they think they can get their way uh, are blocked. If they're in a painful situation that can only be resolved through uh, this kind of dialogue. That's what international relations scholars refer to as a ripe moment. And, and you see this in uh, the strikes that we see uh, in the US nowadays as well. Uh, and it's a, it's a constant theme where each side will be intransigent uh, and demand uh, the high, their way or the highway uh, until they start realizing that they've been in this spot for a long time and it's painful for them. Uh, it's only then that they start exploring other ways to... Yeah, I have to admit, I don't find this particularly convincing. I mean, there are some people in America for whom the system simply doesn't work and the system works even less and less. The headlines today are about more inequality, more homelessness in America. And much, I think, of the rebellion of Trump and people like that against the system are because of the failure of the system itself. And that doesn't come from what's in our heads, Peter. That comes from what's on the ground, the reality of the situation. Sure, the situation is the primary thing. And so I'm not saying that that's not uh, essential. Uh, what's in our heads exacerbates the problem. Uh, and so with, with regard to issues like poverty, uh, inequality, uh, all those things are real problems. And what all I'm saying is to address those problems, you need all those involved to realize that if they don't address those problems, they're going to be in a bad spot. And right now we're not quite there yet. And, Who's going to tell them this? You mean this is something that they know? You've suggested that often we're not able to perceive our situations particularly rationally. I mean, it seems to me, I mean, you describe this science of how relationships are built, broken and repaired. I'm not sure how valuable the science is. It's not helping us with a fix. As far as your first question, who's going to tell them this? The situation's going to tell them this. It's when they realize that things are not good and they need to change course. And we've seen this again and again and again in all sorts of situations like this. Yeah, but so, you, you haven't given any examples. You gave the example of South Africa and then you acknowledge that it probably hadn't fixed the situation. Right. If you look at every uh, major management labor relations strike uh, that's occurred uh, in the past 50 years, you will see this dynamic. Uh, you will also see this dynamic in the attempts to reach peace settlements in different factions uh, at an international scale. So this does happen. This does, it takes a long time and you may not be patient enough to wait for that. Uh, but, and the thing is people will deny that reality uh, as long as they can. Uh, but ultimately, there is a moment where the reality 
cannot be denied. And that's where real dialogue happens. It may not lead to a perfect solution, but it leads to progress. And ultimately, when you deal with huge scale problems like apartheid in South Africa, it's not something that you can expect to be rectified by a handful of people in a room. It takes a long time to address these kinds of historical incidents. So as far as today uh, in the US, uh, we, we can take those lessons and understand that these are difficult problems. We may not have what it takes to address them at the moment because the will may not be there. Uh, but if things get worse, as things get worse, more and more of us will recognize that these are problems and we can't just keep pointing fingers and, and pretending like our view is the only view that works. Yeah, I wish uh, I wish I shared your optimism. I mean, we've done shows on the Arab-Israeli conflict. Uh, people have always said that, and it gets worse and worse. Cyprus, it gets worse and worse. Uh, I'm not an expert on Rwanda, but I'm not entirely sure that was a particularly happy ending. Certainly, South Africa has always teetered on some sort of civil war or other. I hope you're right, Peter, but you're doing a good job remaining uh optimistic congratulations on the new book how trust works the science of how relationships are built broken and repaired and one way i think to get trust back is to read good media i want to remind everyone that our sponsor um of uh keenon uh is now liberty's quarterly uh and it's a magazine a quarterly full of excellent writing which is entirely trustworthy so uh you want to trust, read Liberties, uh, and that's libertiesjournal.org. Uh, so thank you, Peter. And I'm just going to run an ad now for uh, Liberties just to explain what it's all about. Beyond the news, the noise, there is nuance, insight. Liberties is not just a journal of ideas. It's a meteor of intelligent substance. It's the place to be for engaged citizens. Politics, opinion, substance. Liberties is a triumph for freedom of thought, a quarterly of urgency, of cultural exploration, of intellectual delight, of immaculate prose. It's invaluable. Subscribe now or find Liberties at your favorite bookseller.